Hi, I'm Ben, and I've spent the last few years working on reliability and observability at Airbnb. Before I get into this more, I'd also just like to note that last week we uh, turned off our uh, Graphite main box that was servicing our stats D. So yeah, just click the terminate button. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about how our incident response team grew out of our engineering org and how its unique characteristics influence our use of alerting. I've been using Datadog for many years, and it has become a core component of how we think about our monitoring. So we've grown extremely rapidly as both a business and as an engineering team. As you can see from this chart, the uptick has been dramatic. <laughs> it was easier than getting it cleared with uh, press, so... <laughs> Uh, this makes staying on top of things uh, particularly challenging. So we've grown, this has shaped the uh, way we do engineering, and it has influenced some of the uh, structures that we've built to support it. The early days, long before my time, we really only had one person handling systems and operations for what was fast becoming a tidy little business. And this engineer was great, so things were usually fine, you know, unless he wanted to go camping, or take a break, or really have any sort of life whatsoever. And uh, we're a product-driven uh, company, and so we were hiring more product engineers because that's what we needed at the time. And we weren't focused on you know, building out a large infrastructure team to uh, pass the pager around. So it just wasn't where we were. Still, it wasn't fair for this one guy to always be on call. So to help share the load, some other engineers volunteered to learn about our systems and how to operate them. They were then av able to take over the pager. And these engineers came from all different teams. They did not necessarily have any experience with incident response. Some of our most enthusiastic uh, were front-end engineers. So this was, uh, this was pretty, uh, pretty interesting for everyone. But there were plenty of opportunities to learn in these chaotic times. And so people quickly ramped up on uh, skills and gained uh, all of this experience. And they dubbed themselves the sysops. Hats were made. <laughs> So our growth frequently tipped things over. It was not uncommon to see this group uh, congregate around a cluster of standing desks known as Standyland. And they were trying to figure out why the site was down and how to fix it. It was actually a pretty fun time, all things considered. People were just like yelling around. It's like, you know, on like a trading floor <laughs> or something, just yelling theories and like brandishing graphs. And, you know, eventually things worked out. Um, so, as new engineers joined the company, they'd see this spectacle, and some would want to join. And as it turns out, people will go to great lengths for hats. So, another aspect of this was that these uh, volunteers were getting really good at operating our systems and responding to incidents. They were growing as engineers and also taking that knowledge back to their regular work. So, this was going very well. So, we, we kept it and built on it. We formalized the lessons into training sessions that covered topics like the different components of our infrastructure, our monitoring tools, and approaches to fix common problems. These trainings are held in our very serious looking Dr. Strangelove themed conference room at the office, uh, which is shown here. Uh, this definitely makes the content uh, seem way more serious. Uh, and it became, uh, but it became apparent that the content here was broadly relevant. So we opened these trainings up to anyone with an interest, even if they weren't planning on joining the on-call rotation. These days, we have about 50 people on the rotation, and 30% of engineering has attended the training. We also made the switch from hats to hoodies. We also literally, as a group, went yak shaving once. <laughs> So all of this uh, does tie into how we do monitoring and alerting. For the simple reason that with uh, 50 people on the rotation, any individual will only spend a few weeks out of the year on call. And these tours may be rather spread out. This means that we can't depend on institutional knowledge to know which pages are OK to ignore. Uh, we'd also probably have a harder time attracting uh, volunteers if we kept people, waking people up at 3 a.m. All pagers go off at 3 a.m. It's the rule. Don't question it. Uh, and this would be especially true uh, if it's because of disk full alerts on some uh, misconfigured test box. Uh, additionally, the sysop will very likely have never seen the particular alert before and may not have even heard of the system that is uh, alerting. <laughs> Uh, but we still need to keep things under control and get a handle on it. 
As such, uh, we have a very high bar uh, for alerts of the pager class. We tend to reserve these for system or business metrics that show that we very likely have a problem. These include things like top line application error rate and things like reservations not going through or messages not being sent. We strive to keep these sensitive, but still to um, minimize uh, false positives. So we have a screenshot of our Slack notifications during an incident. Messages created dropped and uh, new listings dropped are about as serious as uh, they sound. So we were glad to get uh, that notification uh, pretty quickly. Uh, but we also have a lot of like uh, non-paging sort of informational alerts that can uh, either uh, inform us about cleanup tasks or give us situational um, awareness when an incident is ongoing. So we can kind of see what else might be leading to that and get to a diagnosis faster. So since the sysop may lock context around the alert, we try and include all of that context in the alert message. This often comes in the form of links to other dashboards, to saved Kibana searches, or to run books. This will hopefully be enough to determine the impact and also uh, and how to either attempt a, a resolution or determine whom to escalate to. Uh, so in this example, we walk through the fairly convoluted steps of getting a, a backtrace with uh, Ruby debugging symbols from a particular misbehaving process that uh, it's like to stall out sometimes. Um, and then we uh, list uh, some common remediations. I'm sure you'll never guess what the most common fix to uh, these problems is. <laughs> so. Um, in, on top of all of this, individual in engineering teams are also encouraged to set up their own on-call schedules and direct alerts of both the paging and non-paging variety at themselves. And we're constantly building new services and adding new metrics, all while our traffic and scale changes. We have to keep adding to and updating our alerts to keep pace with reality. So this ends up with a ton of people working on alerts and also depending on them. It also makes common standards, shared knowledge, and uh, review of like how we're doing things even more important. So to make uh, alert management easier, one of my colleagues, Igor, wrote a tool called Interferon that allows us to manage our Datadog monitors via a repository of executable alert specifications. Monitoring is code. So we really like the pattern of storing as much of our configuration as possible as code. Um, and almost everything that we might want to sync up with an external provider or even some of our internal configuration is at least stored in Git and is very often executable. So this allows us to use the tools that we're uh, familiar with and already use everywhere else when we're you know, working on you know, whatever. Um, and it also means that we don't have to depend on our providers to implement things like versioning, search, or the right APIs to pull out all of the uh, configuration values that we clicked in through the web interface. Uh, so we, like allow we also uh, like allowing the uh, configuration to be executable because it allows for uh, more creativity. Um, and you can uh, then adapt things inside of the actual uh, like alert specifications uh, based on your needs at the time, rather than depending on the framework creator to have anticipated all of them. Um, and we've seen in the past when it's been like pure data, people just generate ad hoc scripts to create massive amounts of data, and that's hard to maintain and confusing as well. But allowing for code here also does allow things to get messier. You can't just you know, take from one like JSON format, pass it through a simple transformation, and output in like a new clean format. You have to account for uh, all of the uh, all of the different patterns and all of the arbitrary code that, be co uh, that could be included in here. That said, the, uh, the trade-off usually works to our advantage. Um, and uh, really, I can't overemphasize how important uh, grep and git and you know, all of the ecosystem around like git, like um, you know, our internal GitHub and uh, pull requests and all of that stuff is for uh, knowing how things evolve and change over time. So Interferon is our DSL for specifying Datadog alerts. It's open source on our GitHub, so you can check that out. But let's walk through creating an alert with this framework. If you are familiar with Datadog's monitor management interface, uh, you might see some similarities. So first, we define the metric. In this case, we're looking at the average of bytes sent from each uh, machine with the uh, chef roll Thumbor. And Thumbor is an image resizing proxy. So we set the alert condition. Uh, so 
Uh, then we set the alert conditions. These are thresholded as a 10-minute uh, average of less than 200 kilobytes uh, per second. If we're serving less than that, we're probably not serving images, and that's a problem. Uh, so the Datadog UI actually has really good uh, tools for exploring the metric versus the alert condition. So we're probably cheating and plugging that into preview. Um, so next, we need to describe what is happening in the alert. Uh, we go into detail with information on where to find logs, advice uh, to try turning it off and on again, and a link to a higher level dashboard. Um, and finally, we set who gets notified. This is important, like images are a huge part of Airbnb, uh, so we want this to notify um, the sysops pager duty. But we also want to separately notify uh, two, uh, two members of the team that directly own uh, this service. Um, so you know, we hit save on this uh, file, we you know, open a pull request, deploy our changes, and then we'll see that our monitor is synced up on Datadog. But things get way more exciting because we can do more uh, from inside of this um, uh, alerts repo. Uh, we, can we can write alert specifications that use additional information that's gathered about our uh, inf infrastructure from various sources that we might not have available in Datadog or might not be as intuitive to use from inside of Datadog. So one of our key concepts here is the host information source. We use this to pull in uh, data about every instance, RDS database server, Dynamo table, and even like far weirder things. Like we have some set of like offline jobs that we know about and monitor um, and pull in data as though they were hosts. So in this example, this is some of our uh, Dynamo um, DB uh, monitoring code. And uh, the key thing with Dynamo is that you provision the throughput, and that's how, uh, and that's the knob that you uh, twist with this. Uh, and once you hit 100%, you have a bad time, but then you just click a button, and 15 minutes later, it's scaled. So we set alerts um, when we go over the read capacity at 80%. Um, and we set the and we create these alerts for every uh, every table that we have uh, there, and this is automatically set from our. Um, you know, that we've pulled the list of tables we have from uh, the AWS API, and we go over that. We can use other information we get from the AWS API, like what region it's in, uh, to define the uh, alert message. Um, and then <clears throat> the, the really important thing here, though, is that we know what the read capacity is uh, and what the provision capacity is there, so we can uh, pull that value we can pull that value down, multiply it by 0.8, and thus know when we've crossed 80% of it. Uh, this also demonstrates for the notifications, we're using uh, tags that we've set uh, via the AWS console on the table uh, to hold the team name and the names of other owners of it, and we just plug those into the notification settings to uh, know who to uh, bug about this. Um, <clears throat> So this approach also allows us to uh, code review alerts uh, via GitHub. So in this example, an engineer had noticed that we didn't alert on an error spike in an application and proposed a set of alert conditions. Multiple members of her team reviewed and signed off on this change. So this helps get exposure to know that people are working on, uh, on alerts as well as, like make, as well as like, you know, helping to make sure that we're alerting on the right things and you know, using common standards. So, this was, a resound this was overall a resounding success. We uh, have 730 alert specifications that expand out to over 11,000 Datadog monitors. Uh, and the internal adoption was actually uh, such that we ended, having so ended up having so many alerts that syncing them was running into uh, performance problems. So one of our SREs, uh, Jimmy, has been working on fixing this and has pretty much solved the problem for us. He also wrote a parser for the Datadog query syntax so that we can parse, uh, uh, parse syntax errors in alerts while we're running uh, continuous integration on them before we push them out. Um, and we're still working on getting these changes cleaned up, uh, but we hope to have these uh, open sourced and uh, you know, pushed to our uh, GitHub soon. So with all of these, uh, yeah, with all of these monitors, uh, reducing alert noise is very important. It would really be terrible if you know, we had 11,000 uh, monitors triggering constantly. Um, and it takes very little noise before trust and the sense of urgency uh, degrade. Uh, 
So it's way easier to, conf and it's also way easier to configure uh, email filters than it is to go through, evaluate, and fix alerts. And with alerts to the page, at least they annoy people into fixing them and making them better. Um, and we also start from a smaller and more set, a severe set to begin with. For informational alerts, it's harder, and it's a constant struggle, and like, you know, sometimes we're doing very well with it, and other times we're not. We found that the way, that the only way to really tackle this is to have someone who owns this, who's constantly iterating on both the alerts and the thresholds, and following up, and making sure they're relevant, and they're triggering for the right things, um, and, you know, just really, and just really watching to make sure that it stays, uh, stays useful. Um, and you know this is and this is important because no one likes filling out that line in the postmortem where uh, you discuss the relevant alert uh, that triggered that would have uh, prevented the whole thing, but it was buried under you know the 50 other things that were irrelevant and also triggered at the time. Uh, so one of my colleagues, uh, Willie, uh, has really, really owned this at Airbnb. Is like really advanced um, the state of the art for us. But there's another reason that thing uh, that this needs to be owned. And that's so that our monitoring can evolve with the new capabilities from uh, the vendor. We use Datadog and a lot of our, you know, the whatever as a service, a large part because uh, their offerings continue to get better even when we're not looking. Uh, but we still need to incorporate uh, these uh, new features to take advantage of them. So a great example of this is the support for the anomaly detection that uh, you guys just heard about. Um, so. Our metrics uh, experience pretty severe uh, seasonality layered upon an overall trend of up and to the right. Uh, so our metrics are highest on Mondays when people are planning their uh, trips, but gradually decrease as the week goes on, hitting their lowest points when people are actually on their trips on the weekend. You can see the difference between peak and trough is substantial. So the anomalies uh, function is particularly useful for uh, the business metrics that we favor for uh, paging. Um, and we've worked with Datadog uh, to take advantage of this, and it's quickly uh, become uh, the function of choice for a lot of the things that we, uh, that we page on in a lot of our most critical alerts. It actually took me a while to find uh, an example of a, an alert that uh, paged that wasn't using the anomalies function when I was uh, preparing this presentation. Um, but the success case for this is kind of boring. It's like we, we alert when we should, and we don't alert when we shouldn't alert, uh, you know, more of the time. Uh, failure, yeah, failures are, failures are more fun. And we actually had a, uh, ran into a great example of where our understanding of uh, anomaly detection didn't quite match up with reality and resulted in, you know, things that we definitely should have thought, uh, should have fired, not firing. Uh, and this all occurred on Friday when we were all being uh, DDoSed by household objects. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> before I go any further, uh, the case we hit was well documented and you know well discussed, and you just heard about it you know a few minutes ago. But our understanding of it was um, we thought was complete, but it was incomplete. There's some like subtle. Um, there are some subtle things here, and anomaly alerting requires a shift in mental models, and uh, and in your mindset uh, compared with you know like a threshold based alert or like a stable like percentage change based alert. Um, so. <clears throat> Anomaly detection is visualized as this gray band representing the expected uh, range of values for a metric. So in this case, in the week-long view, things look, uh, things look pretty good. The uh, gray band hugs our metric, and we can see the ano uh, anomaly uh, on Friday during the Mirai DDoS. Uh, however, because of data smoothing, uh, this does not uh, show the whole story. Um, and it's not, just the, it's not just the shape of the line that uh, is changed by the data smoothing, it's also the shape of the expected uh, bounds. Um, so we zoom in to a few hours around the incident, and things still look pretty good. The gray, uh, the gray line is nice and tight, and we see uh, the anomaly in the metric. It, ev it actually even like, comes out clearer here, so you know, things are pretty good. But just to be diligent, uh, you know, the evaluation window for the alert is set to 30 minutes. So let's zoom in even more just to uh, check. And the anomaly has escaped our detection. Uh, and it's escaped our detection even as the metric is hitting up against uh, origin. Um, and 
this illustrates that the yeah it's not just the metric line that changes it's the balance change based on uh, based on the uh, time window so <clears throat> what uh what may be anomalous when rolled up may seem to be within the normal range when expanded so the other thing to note is that the expected band in the weak view has a width that is three times smaller than the width of the expected band when zoomed in. So in the week-long view, uh, where uh, the, band, the band's width is about 40% of the midpoint value of the metric over that time period, whereas uh, for the 30-minute period, the width is 130%. That allows us to uh, <laughs> go to zero um, without anything uh, being out of place. Um, so, uh, and, this, and this was just a, a choice of the wrong algorithm in this case. Uh, the previous uh, expected band was generated with the Agile algorithm. And it's designed to update quickly to account, account for intended level changes. It's explicitly less robust in the face of longer lasting anomalies like uh, what we experienced. We we're also very likely in the worst case for this algorithm as we were at lower traffic time and the degradation came on somewhat rep, uh, gradually. So we fixed this by switching to the robust algorithm, which is a better fit for what we want it to accomplish. And the result here, the result is shown here. Um, it does not dramatically adjust its values uh, based on the ongoing uh, incident. So uh, this is a comparison over the week-long view, and you can see the difference uh, in algorithm style. Uh, when the yeah, when the metric is on the downswing in the Agile model, we give it plenty of uh, room to continue on that trend, whereas robust, uh, robust is keeping it a bit uh, tighter and doesn't expect it to uh, deviate as much. Um, so, but the real point of this is not you know that we misread uh, what the algorithm or misunderstood what the algorithms were meant to do. The real point here is that you need to examine and understand your false negatives. Or put another way, never let a good downtime go to waste. Uh, we would not have uh, known that we weren't protected by this alert if my teammate Jason hadn't investigated what was going on. So perhaps it was a good thing that Twitter and Reddit were also having problems. Uh, so I wonder if, it, but I do wonder if there's like an opportunity for uh, some sort of simulation or, you know, like some scenario-based thing, so that when you're setting these alerts, you can kind of simulate. Uh, you know, how the anomaly detection will react to different sorts of uh, circumstances. So, uh, when working with anomaly detection alerts, it's probably a good idea to keep your, your existing alerts on the metric in place uh, initially, or to even add some simple, like, safety rails-based um, alerts, uh, or safety th rails threshold-based alerts, just to uh, kind of catch uh, strong deviations that you might otherwise miss. And then during the evaluation period, um, when one, one alert fires but the other doesn't, compare and see what was the correct behavior and try to understand you know, what was going on there. Uh, this really prevents being complacent about the alert that will never fire. Um, so looking towards the future, there's still a lot that we can do to improve our alerting situation. Um, there's the obvious stuff, like we can continue reducing noise and making uh, our alerts more relevant, provide better context, uh, but there's also like some bigger shifts that we can make. So we're very much in the email and Slack uh, world of notifications still, but we could take uh, much more advantage of uh, Datadog's webhook alerting support as well as their other integrations. Uh, so I saw, um, I saw uh, Corey's uh, JIRA tickets, and I want them. Um, and we frequently have these uh, cleanup tasks that can be done later. They don't necessarily need to be done immediately. Um, the DynamoDB example that I showed actually would be a prime candidate. We only need to drop everything and handle it if it's rapidly on its way to 100%. Um, you know, if it hit 80% and it was at, uh, you know, 79% yesterday and we'll be at 81% uh, tomorrow. Like, we have some time. Um, and uh, apparently Datadog has an integration specifically for JIRA integration, uh, so we'll be exploring that. We also, like, uh, we also 
frequently use alerts uh, or frequently have alerts around things to give us situational awareness. But when uh, when stuff is going wrong, like a lot of these are firing at once, so it can be kind of hard to filter uh, through that. So we almost want to we almost want a way to like uh, kind of group and surface and aggregate and kind of combine all of these secondary alerts uh, together to give us like a context dashboard and also just avoid getting overwhelmed uh, during an incident. If we have a uh, you know, if we have an alert that says uh, no requests are going through to this service, um, and possibly with a more specific reason uh, why, it would be terrible if we got uh, if we if that was completely overwhelmed by alerts that CPU was um, was idle on uh, you know 150 hosts. Like we'd get 150 emails and like not really not really be able to uh, go through that, um, and. It would also be great to include uh, messages or links in the uh, messages of the alerts so that you can click on whether the alert was helpful or you know false positive and kind of categorize it from there. I also liked Corey's uh, like feedback uh, links there, but I think like collecting uh, statistics on when an alert fires um, uh, incorrectly could really help us uh, focus our attention uh, on the uh, uh, noisiest uh, ones. So. In conclusion, um, much of our alerting and monitoring culture has evolved out of the challenges of keeping the on-call rotation accessible to people from across engineering. Our volunteer sysop group has helped the entire org share both knowledge and the burden of keeping Airbnb up. It has fostered links between teams that would otherwise be rather disconnected. And engineers have picked up new skills and gained exposure to detail that, uh, that would otherwise be hidden. We've worked together to achieve greater reliability. This background has led to our adoption and creation of tools that play to our philosophies. Datadog gives us a metrics and alerting platform that we trust that requires little, uh, little from us to maintain. We built Interferon on top of this uh, so that we can easily create uh, you know, shared and standardized alerts and make alerting very easy and you know, audible auditable. But there's still plenty that we can uh, continue to do for the future, and we still constantly need to improve you know, what we're doing and make, uh, make our monitoring more relevant and make better use of the data that we generate. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, yeah, so uh, we have uh, an internal tool called uh, Deploy Board that handles, that we use for pretty much everything. And this, it has like a really fun interface. So that caused us to think of everything as a deploy because there's lots of like uh, boxes that light up in cool colors and you really feel like you're doing something when you deploy. Uh, so what we have is we put it, uh, we put it on a box. Uh, we have a box that runs uh, the alerting code and it will, when you make a change, you uh, you push that out, it does like the SSH loop, gets the uh, artifact in there, does a run of the Interferon framework, and that syncs up with uh, Datadog. And then we also, to catch changes that happen with information, I believe uh, have um, all of the alert specifications reevaluate it uh, every hour or so. So this picks up um, so this picks up changes like when we've added new DynamoDB tables or added new hosts. They'll uh, we don't have to do a, a deploy to add uh, monitors to them. They'll just pick up uh, the changes automatically during the scheduled uh, period. We got time for for just this this last question, I think, and then we'll try to get back on track. You uh, seem to show that there was a, a code review-like process for deploying a new monitor. Who does the code reviews? For example, do I get to say that before you set up that I get paged at 3 a.m., I get to do a review of the monitor you're, you're setting up for that? So, I mean, <laughs> doesn't really, yeah, it doesn't usually come out to that. Uh, usually, uh, it, so it varies team to team. Uh, when you're, we try and like kind of democratize that. So in that case, the only people were, who were involved in that pull request were uh, uh, members of that team. Um, if you start just adding pager, yeah, if you start adding the sysops pager duty or other teams uh, to get paged, you know, we might have to have a chat. Uh, uh, but like overall, it hasn't you know been an issue. Um, if you want feedback on it, you can tag the observability team or you know the SRE team and like kind of integrate that. But yeah, really, people probably in some ways yeah in some ways because we have the high bar for paging like 
sometimes that, yeah, sometimes people even forget that that's an option. Um, luckily, we have like a good base level of coverage. People really don't like waking each other up. It's, it's kind of nice. Uh, you said uh, you, you guys have 50 plus volunteers uh, as part of the on call. What motivates them? Like as an engineer, what motiv motivates me to sign up for on call? Like, uh, <laughs> did you see our hoodies and our hats? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, in, but in all seriousness, uh, it's, a, like, it's a very good way to get exposure to the organization uh, and, like, and, this, you know, special, uh, like, and this specialty. It's like uh, people, you know, and also when you respond to an incident, you get to be the big damn hero, and that feels pretty good, too, um, <laughs> you know, sometimes. Uh, but, yeah, no, like, it's a lot of people who are just have an interest in kind of learning about, like, the back-end systems and, like, more of, like, what happens when an incident goes along. We have a very supportive uh, culture of, like, and write post-mortems about everything, and, you know, they're more, sometimes they veer to the uh, side of, like, sagas celebrating uh, <laughs> the heroism of, uh, you know, of the sysops, and I think that's just fine. Um, it's just a good, it's just a good opportunity to uh, meet and work with people that you wouldn't otherwise. And again, you're on call for a couple weeks a year. Like, uh, it's actually not too bad. Like, it's not too bad at all. So, yeah. Thank you.